Despite being generally considered to be quite bad, sometimes burn or heal effects can win you matches by themselves. In this video, we'll be going over some of the more notable examples of cards being played exclusively due to that. First, let's start off with Firecracker, a card which received a lot of attention when the new time rules were first implemented. This is a level 4 Fire Fiend monster which can, as a quick effect, discard itself to burn your opponent for 1000 points of damage, but then you skip your next draw phase. It also has an effect on field where it gets a counter every time your opponent takes effect damage and then removes all the counters to inflict the render damage to your opponent for each tier in the end phase. Let's quickly go over how the time rules work so it's clear why such a bad card ever saw play. Right now, in competitive Yu-Gi-Oh, when the time allotted for your match is over, what happens is the current turn player gets to continue up until the end phase they're on. And then the game ends and whoever has the most life points wins. Or if both players have the same, it's a draw. So for example, if time on the round is called while you're inside your main phase, the game will end together as soon as it does. It doesn't matter if you have a full board of beaters and they have nothing. If your opponent has higher life points than you do at the end of the phase, they will win the game. These time rules are very controversial within the community and have led to really contentious situations in tournament play. One time someone even got banned from Konami events for talking about how often he'd win in time by using Gaga Ga Cowboy. There was also one iconic match where time was about to be called and the turn player had cleared all interactions from their opponent's board and was about to move into the battle phase. However, when he declared he was going to try to move to the battle phase, the opponent thought for a while before uselessly activating his Borolo Dragon's effect to make a face up monster lose 500 tag in defense, which took up enough time to make time end while it was still the main phase. This sealed the game for the player with the Borolo Dragon, who had a life point lead. Firecracker was seen as one of the first generic ways to abuse how the time rules worked, since if the match drags onto the point where there's not enough time for game 3 to even reach the battle phase, you can just discard this card and then win the best of 3 for yourself. But while people did think it'd be a mainstay for a while, people usually preferred to play more easily accessible ways to burn that didn't require you to hard draw into them, like Gaga Ga Cowboy for example, who has an effect to burn for 800 points of damage, and only requires any two level 4 monsters to bring him out of the extra deck. The ability to be used during either player's turn is great, but not enough to take up three side deck slots over other staples that will help you win in more situations. With all that said, this card actually managed to secure itself a topping spot in the list as recently as this year, because Math Mech decks can actually search it somewhat consistently with Prime Math Mech Albertium's 3 material effect. While this card didn't make that big of an impact, we've seen a slight rise in popularity of hand traps which can also win you the game on time, even if they're not meant for only that. Ghost Mortar and Moonlit Chill has always been one of the less used Ghost Curl hand traps. Ghost Mortar has the effect where if your opponent spells them as a monster, it can discard itself to target and negate the effects of that monster, but it also inflicts burn damage equal to its attack if it leaves the field. This card was often seen as a worse effect veiler since it has to be triggered on summon and it's also a hard once per turn. So for a long time, no one would be playing Mortar unless they were already maxed out on veilers. On top of that, effect veiler itself is a worse infinite impermanence so you'd probably max it out on that one first. However, in recent times, we've seen lists opting to play Mourner over both of these other cards. But while the burn effect does play a large role in why, it's still much better outside of time than every other card we'll be talking about. It has the niche over Veiler in that it can be used outside the main phase, so quick play starters can't play around it, and the perk over impermanence in that it's also a no material if you're nearing time, or if you can remove their monster yourself, it's a straight up win condition. However, things are even more extreme for the last yokai girl to be printed. Ghost Sister and Spooky Dogwood. This hand trap can discard itself to make it so that you gain life points equal to the attack of every monster your opponent summons during the main phase and battle phase until the end of the turn. This card is played essentially in the same way Firecracker was, as you just chain it in an effect that would spell summon a monster, like Gigantic Sprite or Teal Element Shiren, to get higher life points in time. Spooky Dogwood was very widely panned on release, as it didn't actually impact your opponent's plays unlike cards like Ash Blossom or Ghost Spell did which had been on the meta for a couple of years by then. There were comparisons to be made with Maxi, as this is another card that technically punishes your opponent for overextending, but you can't really compare gaining card advantage with Maxi to gaining a life lead with Spooky Dogwood. The usual logic was that if your opponent had made a board strong enough to keep you from playing for a turn, odds are they could handle the extra draw phase or two this could give you. While this logic was true for the longest time, it's gone out the window in the most couple of recent formats. Spooky Dogwood is now a staple side deck hand trap, which you'd very likely see in many topping lists of any given modern tournament. A couple of months ago, it was because the danger tier limit decks took forever to execute their combos, which made going into time very likely. 
Then there was Runic Sprite, which skips all its battle phases and can't really close a game while being on top of card advantage. Now the problem is reaches Apex with Ishizu Tier Elements hitting the West. This is an extremely technical deck with a really difficult mirror match, in which both players are playing during each other's turn due to all of the in-engine hand traps and can create chains and go as high as chain link 12. The issue with time is so bad with this deck that, despite there being extra time for matches that happen during top cut, many of the finals went into time playing the mirror anyways. Now let's talk about some more specific techs for winning on time. Red Resonator is a level 2 fire fiend tuner which can, when it's normal summon, special summon a level 4 or lower monster from your hand. Also, when it's special summoned, you can target one face up monster in the field and gain light points equal to its attack. Red Resonator has seen some play before this year as a generic tuner extender in decks that just wanted to spam the field, such as Dark Synchro. But it's really coming to the spotlight now as a guaranteed one of in every single sprite side deck. This card can be special summoned straight from the deck with Gigantic Sprite, but it's also fine to draw it since you can link it off and then use Sprite Elf to bring it back. Red Resonator plays an even bigger role in Runic Sprite variants though. The Runic R-Type revolves around giving you powerful spell interruptions with insane draw power through their field spell, at the cost of getting up your next battle phase whenever you use one of your spells. Since just using one of your engine pieces skips your battle phase, you're highly likely to go into time with Runic, especially if you have an opponent who doesn't want to surrender. A really stubborn player can disdain on a clearly lost game which you cannot finish due to your runic cards and force the game into time as soon as a game 2 out of a best out of 3. This is especially bad for you since the sprite engine will make you lose life points with sprite starter. All of this makes the deck have to side in the red resonator almost every game past the first, even if there's still plenty of time on the clock, just not to have a win foiled by an opponent who won't give up. Another interesting thing about this card is that it actually has a gimmicky almost FTK associated with it. Number 43, Manipulator Souls, is a rank 2 XEs, which, when you gain life points, can deal the same amount of burn damage to your opponent. So, if you can get Red Resonator to special summon a Sprite Gamma Burst boosted gigantic sprite with an extra deck monster under it, you can deal a bit over 4,000 damage to your opponent, and then revive Red Resonator with Sprite Elf during their turn to deal the remaining amount. But of course, this clunky setup has never really seen any competitive play. On the other side of the meta, Tier Laments have gone through quite some developments when it comes to winning in time already. Gagaga -Ga -Ga Cowboy has of course been a staple in it in every deck that goes into rank 4s, but let's go over some more unique options. In more combo based variants which relied hugely on dangers and other generic extenders to turbo out Curious a Light Sworn Dominion for its amazing mill effect, we saw the rise of Skullmark Ladybug. This is a level 4 earth insect monster which simply increases your life points by 1000 points when it's sent to the graveyard in any way. Its usage is simple enough, you just need to open a way into Curious, or your Foolish Burial, or just luckily blind mill into it to win on time. The only issue with this approach is that these variants all ran Pot of Desires, which banishes the top 10 cards of your deck to let you draw 2, or Gizmek Orochi, which can banish 8 cards from the top of your deck face down to summon itself, both of which could banish your Ladybug by mistake and prevent your win if you got unlucky. This led to some top players switching to Agave Dragon instead. This is a Link 4 monster which takes 2 plus monsters except tokens as materials. When it's Link summoned, you get some minor effects depending on the amount of monsters of a certain type in your graveyard. Namely, you deal 100 burn for each dragon, have Agave gain 200 attack for each dinosaur, make all your opponent's monsters lose 300 attack for each sea serpent, and then finally you can gain 400 life points for each worm. The synergy comes from the fact that when any of the tier limit girls are sent to the graveyard by card effect, you can use their effects to fusion summon Mud Dragon of the Swamp, a worm monster, as long as you have another non-aqua dark monster available in your hand, graveyard, or field. This is of course trivial in decks with high amounts of dangers, and other countless good generic darks. This turned this very meh generic Link 4, that was actually my video on the top 10 worst Link monsters, into a side deck staple. The latest advancement came with the release of Sprite Sprint. This is a Link 2 which can be made with any 2 monsters, including one level 2, rank 2, or Link 2 monster, and gets to send any level 2 monster from your deck to the graveyard when it's brought out. This is a really useful card for both Sprite and Tier, as they both have amazing targets they really want to hit the graveyard. Since Sprint is now a staple, this has led to the rise of Volcanic Scattershot as an option. This is a level 2 Pyro monster which deals 500 damage to your opponent when it's sent to the graveyard. Also, if it's sent there by the effect of Blaze Accelerator, you can mill two other scatter shots from your hand or deck to the graveyard to destroy all monsters your opponent controls. Once upon a time, the Raigeki effect when comboed with Blaze Accelerator Reload was the main feature of this card, with the burn just being a small added bonus. But now, it's the other way around. While Sprint exists and is as easy as it is to summon, this will continue to be a very clear solution for time and round. But while this one could technically be used for both top decks now, most sprites continue to stick with Red Resonator since it works better with the engine anyways. Still, with the release of the new Ishizu cards, we're now seeing more diversity within the tier limits burn win con again. While Scattershot is still always readily accessible, we've seen a small resurgence of Skullmark Ladybug, because both you and your opponent will be milling cards in the mirror, and while the Ladybug can't be accessed directly, 
it gives more life points than a scattershot burns for, letting you walk away with a life lead. The issue with time is so rampant with these cards that one of the top 4 players of a recent YCS actually played a full playset of Skullmarked Ladybugs on his side deck, and even said it was one of his most consistently cited cards. Even if you go as far back as the so-called Eternal format, where Sky Striker, Salomon Great, Thunder Dragon, and Orcus dominated, you can see that Konami was already keen on printing some easy ways for decks to snatch a match. Sky Striker Ace Kaina was by far the most well-known one, as she gives you 100 life points after you activate a Sky Striker spell card, and Striker has always been a deck which often goes into time, since it has trouble closing out games. Still, Kaina is actually useful outside of time, but the same cannot be said for the option Salomon Great decks use. Salomon Great Paro is a level 5 fire cybers monster who you've probably never seen before. This card has some irrelevant battle related effects, but most importantly, it can tribute itself to let you gain 2000 life points, and is easily searched with Salomon Great Mirage Stalio, which almost any hand can go into. Now, let's finish this video by going over a couple of other interesting options which people have ran. Psychic Life Trancer is a level 7 psychic synchro monster, which lets you remove from play one psychic monster from your graveyard to gain 1200 life points. This card helps short one of the awful weaknesses of adventure punk decks. Your main starter, Zia Min, makes you pay 600 life points, essentially being unactivatable in time. However, there was also an argument for playing Dark Strike Fighter. Dark Strike Fighter lets you tribute a monster to inflict damage to your opponent equal to its level in the field times 200. The pre errata form of this card was a powerful OTK enabler, since it was not a hard once per turn as it is now, but it tributing itself deals 1400 damage, which is still enough to win, and you can even do it under Dimension Shifter, unlike Life Transfer. Scarlight Red Dragon Archfiend is one that has seen play for many reasons through the years. This is a level 8 Dark Dragon Synchro, which takes any tuner and non-tuner monster to make. Its name becomes Red Dragon Archfiend on the field or in the graveyard, and once per turn, it lets you destroy as many effect monsters in the field as possible, with attack less than or equal to Scarlight's, and then do 500 damage to your opponent for each monster destroyed. Guard Dragon decks could abuse this very easily back when Guard Dragon Agrapain was still legal, since it can cheat it out straight from the extra deck. Similarly, Virtual World decks get to do the same thing with Ultimate Zizulkin, for the same effect. And last but not least, of course, Dragon Link can easily go into this with their main starter, Rocket Tracer, which represents a level 8 synchro monster by itself. Recently, a branded pile deck has topped running two Perfor Pal cards as their burn engine for time. Perfor Pal Gatling Ghoul is a level 8 Dark Fiend fusion monster, which takes a Perfor Pal monster and a level 5 or higher Dark monster as its materials. If it's fusion summoned, you get to inflict 200 damage to your opponent for each card in the field, then you can destroy one monster your opponent controls and inflict burn damage equal to its original attack if it was fusion summoned using a pendulum monster as material. Essentially, they can get into this card by using branded fusion to send Fallen of Albaz and the least worst light attribute perform pal monster they want in their deck to go into Albion the branded dragon. Albion can then let you perform another fusion summon by banishing materials from your hand or grave, so you can banish itself and the 5 Rainbow Magician to make Gatling Gun. It's incredible that someone using a deck with easy access to Masquerade the Blazing Dragon, which burns your opponent for doing any action, still wanted to include this small perform pal engine just because of the end of match procedures. While the new time rules have not made the game devolve into activating sparks and stall for 40 minutes like some people thought it would, you can clearly see why it's a sour spot in the community when it makes all kinds of bad cards see play. Nowadays it's only a question of what will be the next pack filler to see play just because it has some slight synergy with whatever are the top engines in the meta at the moment. Alright, and that's it for this episode of the unknown side of Yu-Gi-Oh! If you know of any other cards which have seen play only because of time, or have ideas for future videos just like this one, be sure to leave them down in the comments below.